yeah, my identity as an indigenous woman, as an Oglala woman, as a Cheyenne woman, predates the, even the idea of the U.S. And so for me, my identity is longer standing. My identity is tied to this land, and that goes back since time immemorial. Well, welcome to Crystal Two Bulls. Uh, we at the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, Crystal, are really delighted to have you here uh, this weekend in Fort Wayne. You're our keynote speaker for our uh, 10th annual uh, commemoration for the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And mm -hmm. this year, as you know, it's the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration. Mm -hmm. We'll get to more of that in a minute, but uh, lesser known, but equally important uh, is the 2007 UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, passed with some abstentions, 143 to 4. Mm -hmm. And as you know, the four, abstention, uh, the four negative votes at the time were Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the United States. Mm -hmm. All settler colonial uh, regimes, settler colonial uh, colonies uh, themselves. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, they all re reversed their uh, votes in the meanwhile, but you know that it really needs policy change, not just a matter of a vote. So talk to us about the Declaration uh, of Rights for the Indigenous Peoples and why that's so important. I think and what it is up, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say that there, there's a lot of critique on the UNDRIP, but I think the fact that something like that exists is powerful. And so I think the big thing is really putting teeth to a document like that. I think there's a lot of critique, not just on that document, but there's a critique on the United Nations and the system that exists the way that it does with the U.S. that we've seen recently, right? Being able to just have unlimited veto power and to actually prevent things that are actually documented in the UNDRIP and things that are documented in the, de the Universal Declaration of for Human Rights, right? Uh, but I think we have to continue to organize because, you know, as I think it was Orrin Lyons that originally said it, that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And so if we are not there, we are not actively pushing for policy change, we are not actively pushing for these rights to be recorded into international body of law, that means that we will continue to lose them. We will continue to be the ones that are, are where decisions are being made on our behalf without us even being present. And so I think with the, the UNDRIP in particular, indigenous people sacrificed a lot. You know, there's folks that lost their lives, they were disappeared, they were murdered, they were assassinated, all just to get the UNDRIP passed. And so I think it's important that we honor their legacy and that we keep pushing for that. And also I think that it's important that we continue to stay open for whatever iterations come after the UN. Um, because I think that the UN evolved from the League of Nations and I truly believe that something else is going to evolve from this point because it's actually unsustainable to have colonial projects like the so-called US and like the so-called Israel continue to have veto power and continue to be the final say in all things of the United Nations and so we have to continue to be open to that and still be at the table and push and to provide as many teeth to these documents that exist as we possibly can. Say, tell us a little bit more about UNDRIP. Tell us what, what, what does it contain? Why is it a step forward, but not a step far enough? Yeah, UNDRIP basically lists out all of the rights that indigenous peoples have globally. There's things such as, you know, the right to be able to practice our spirituality and our culture without oppression. There's the right to access to our lands. Um, there's, it lists out all of these rights that that are shared between indigenous peoples, peoples that come from the land and have relationship to the land, it lists those all out. But I also think um, Charmaine Whiteface authored a book, and I just lost the name of it, but she authored a book, and that book critiques the, the UNDRIP, and it lists out the different pieces that indigenous peoples authored this, right? They authored this document, they collectively came together, and they authored this document but whenever it went forward to be passed, all the edits came and they removed certain pieces, right? And I believe, to my knowledge, they removed 
the pieces that would actually give us like legal standing. So that, gave, actually, that gave it teeth. That gave it teeth. Yeah, that actually incorporated things into the international body of law. Um, because although this document exists, there's not much we can do as, as indigenous peoples because we are not a nation state. We're not a voting member of the United Nations. We're simply a forum that can go and push, right, on the nation states that make those decisions so we can advocate, but we don't have the actual teeth. And what they did is they pulled those pieces out that would give us the teeth to actually enforce the, the UNDRIP. You know, that's really an interesting insight that I hadn't thought about. So, yeah, so, so the indigenous peoples, while they have this document, you are really part of the colonial nation states mm -hmm. that are oppressing you in the first place. So any kind of power you might have politically mm -hmm. has to go through the very powers that have subjected you in the first place. Yeah, which is why, like, I was really fortunate to have mentors like Tupac Enrique, who is a part of getting the UNDRIP passed, who was a part of the first indigenous people's contingent that went to Geneva to be recognized and to fight for our rights there. So he was part of that group um, that pushed for that. But what he always taught me and really drilled into me was that we have to define our battlefields. Every single time that we fight a fight within a colonial system against the very colonial system that we are fighting against, there's no way we're going to win. Yeah. We will always lose on those battlefields. And so we have to consistently like zoom out from the struggles that we're engaged in and to see what are the potential other battlefields that we can define, right? For example, getting the treaties that exist here in the so-called U.S. that have been ratified incorporated into the international body of law would be a big step, right? Because that means that international law is mandating the settler colonial project of the so-called U.S. to acknowledge and recognize our rights which are supposed to be there regardless because according to the U.S. Constitution, treaties are the supreme law of the land. So no U.S. legal person that exists here is actually embodying the full Constitution and upholding that because no one is acknowledging that the, the treaties are supreme law of the land. So if we bypass our colonizer and our oppressor, we go straight to this and we define our own battlefield and go straight to the international body of law and incorporate the treaties there, then we actually have the ability to win that fight. Twice now you've used the term so-called U.S., so-called United States. Yeah. Talk to us about why you use that term the way you do. I use that term because I, I don't consider myself American. Like I, I'm Oglala Lakota from the Ocheki Shakoi Nation. I'm Northern Cheyenne, right, from the Northern Cheyenne Nation. Um, and so I don't consider myself American, like I know who I am. And also I refuse to acknowledge this settler colonial project as a nation that was built over the top of my dead ancestors. My ancestors who continue to resist, who continue to fight back all through the 500 years of colonization that we've experienced. I think we're at 530 years now. And they resisted. And we continue to re resist to this day. And so to this day, I refuse to acknowledge them as United States, right? And so I add so-called in there because it, it's just, it's ridiculous to acknowledge them as that. Uh, so oftentimes you'll hear me refer to so-called Canada, so-called US, so-called Israel, because I refuse to acknowledge those projects. And you said uh, previously that you don't consider yourself an American for those reasons, but also because your people precede yeah. America. Yeah, my identity as the, an indigenous woman, as an Oglala woman, as a Cheyenne woman, predates the, even the idea of the U.S. And so for me, my identity is longer standing. My identity is tied to this land, and that goes back since time immemorial. The land. So um, critically important, central to your identity and to the identity of indigenous peoples everywhere around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and your work with um, your work with Honor the Earth, we'll get to uh, uh, the, the, the justice work there, but the land back campaign, mm -hmm. that is central to your work now uh, as an indigenous woman and as the executive director of Honor the Earth. Yeah, I think the land back movement, so Tell us about Land Back. Yeah, so a little bit about Land Back. Um, you know, Land Back was a catchphrase, right, that, that came out of so-called Canada, 
our indigenous relatives up north, north of the medicine line, um, they coined the phrase land back, right? Uh, and they popularized it. They turned it into a hashtag, they, they normalized the use of that. But what we did is we came in and we basically created a political framework around land back and developed out a campaign at one point and now it's a full-blown movement of indigenous peoples reclaiming land. So land back isn't just this theoretical or ambitious idea, it is literally reclaiming indigenous land and putting it back into indigenous hands, right? So it's the little literal reclamation of land, but more importantly, it's the reclamation of our relationship to that land. So when the Doctrine of Discovery, you know, the Papal Bull, I think it was 1493, when that came about, that basically stated and declared that lands that do not have Christians can be claimed on behalf of the sovereign or on behalf of the church uh, or even kingdoms and queendoms, right, based on their relationship to the church. And that opened the door for colonization, settler colonization specifically here in the so-called U.S., right? And what that did is it, it put into motion the removal of us from our lands and from our territories. Um, and that was forced removal enforced by the so-called U.S. military, right? And the U.S., it wasn't even the U.S. military at that time. It was just, you know, volunteer militia groups that were fighting in the Revolutionary War. And then it became the U.S. military because there was so much resistance by indigenous peoples that they became the U.S. military. So it formed around us, um, you know, strategically placing forts in the different places where the most uprising or the strongest uprisings existed, right? But when they did that, they were very intentional about removing us, right? The longest, the many different longest walks that happened in the forced removal all the way to Oklahoma, uh, where all of us apparently were supposed to exist within this really small space in Oklahoma Indian Territory, right? When that didn't work, they tried to use biological warfare. They tried to, you know, gifted us uh, blankets infused or infected with smallpox. Whenever that didn't work and we survived that, then they tried to, you know, massacre us in different places. And we could name all, we're actually coming into the season where the most massacres happened, which is the winter time, because that's when we were, we were actually like in one place and we were camped out, right, to weather the winter. We were kind of at our most vulnerable during that time. And so they attacked us most oftentimes in the winter and would massacre entire villages and communities for us. And so when, when they realized that like none of that was working, and even they went through and slaughtered our buffalo, right, to disconnect us from our life source, right, from food, from materials that we needed practically to live. They tried that. We were still surviving. We still lived through all of that. So they went after our children, right? The boarding schools. The boarding schools. What that did, it was the single most effective way of, of colonizing us and assimilating us, right? What it did was when these children were supposed to be on the land learning, Right, when they were supposed to be developing out skills around housing and healthcare, food, um, governance systems, education systems, based on the land, they were actually learning rape. They were learning violence. They were learning dehumanization. They were learning those things. And all of that was intentional and all of that was centered on removing us from the land. Right? All of that is a direct result of us being disconnected from the land. Therefore, if we are ever to have any justice, in this so-called country, right? It has to start with land back. It has to go back to the roots of what led us to this point. And that is when we were forced to be removed from our lands. And so everything centers on that. You said earlier that um, today that it's been, it's, it's not just an amb ambition, it's not just a dream, but it's actually happening up to, how many acres did you share earlier? And you said even that is uh, an Probably old thing. outdated, yeah. Uh, so about 12 months outdated um, is, it was around 2.5, uh, you know, million acres return, are reclaimed by indigenous peoples. So we're probably closer to like 3 million and more, given that it's 12 months outdated, and the land back movement has been picking up momentum, right? So more work has been done, and I just, I haven't done the, we haven't done the research to like actually have the numbers today, but as of last year, 2022, it was at 2.5 million acres. Had been and how did that happen? Many different ways. Many, many ways. Um, you know, what we've seen so far is we've seen land um, settlers actually wanting to return land that they've inherited or houses or homes or properties that they have. They've actually approached different nations and they've like asked if they can return this. 
Um, churches actually have been, started to give land back. Um, Nuns for Nuns is an organization we've partnered with in the past. Um, radical, you know, Catholic nuns. And they are looking in and exploring legally how they're able to gift land back to nations, how they're able to will land back to the nations, or even like an indigenous-led nonprofit. Um, so those are all avenues that folks have been taking. There's also like co-management is not land back, but it's a step in that direction. Um, the Salish and Kootenai tribe of Montana was in a, a co-management agreement with the federal government for like 15 years, I think it was. And they recently were able to like fully reclaim the entire land that they were co-managing. So an entire buffalo pasture in the thousands of acres was returned back to the Salish and Kootenai mm. through a land back or through a co-management agreement, right? There's also like reclassification and redesignation of land and what their legal status is. And so you can designate them, redesignate them, and it would become tribal land again. So there's many different avenues. Um, and then there's like my favorite, which is like occupation, <laughs> which is, you know, different groups uh, organizing and occupying tracts of land to reclaim that land to have whatever entity owns it, whether it's private, the state, the city, etc., return that land back where it goes, right? Um, and so there's many different avenues. The least effective route has been legal um, in terms of reclaiming land, but it is still a valid route that we can reclaim land. And then lastly, my least favorite um, is purchasing land. Mm -hmm. Tribes have, some tribes that have the resources to be able to purchase land back have been doing that. And so there's now examples of tribes that have purchased land back in their original territories that they were removed from, which is a really powerful and powerful, beautiful thing to happen, is that they are reclaiming lands where they're originally from, not just where their reservation is, but where they are from. And that's really beautiful. So there's many ways land back is happening right now. You're, you're the executive director of Honor the Earth. Uh, and you've talked about the evolution of the mission of Honor the Earth under your and, and uh, 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 Nadia Tanusa's leadership, but under your leadership, you talked about the evolution from an environmental justice organization to a social justice organization with a, a global emphasis going to the roots, mm -hmm. the root causes of climate change, the root causes of mm -hmm. environmental injustice. Mm -hmm. And you call, talk to them about white supremacy, racist capitalism, mm -hmm and settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about those three and why this this evolution is so important in your mind. Yeah, I think, yeah, so we're evolving um, from being kind of a regional organization back into a national and eventually an international global organization that organizes, um, like you said, we, we organize and we believe that the root causes of like climate change, injustices, environmental injustices it, are those three. Um, but what we're going to do is we're actually shifting to organize at the intersections of environmental justice. And so our movements have to be intersectional. You know, I've known this for a long time where we are stronger together. And so I've always known that when we go out and we fight these fights, we have to be able to work across many different movements. And that's what shifting ourselves into being a social justice organization does. But what it also does is it helps us fight at the root causes, right? So I can spend my life fighting pipelines and mines and all the projects that come up from these corporations, right? These, from the extractive industry. I can continue to fight those and not make any traction. My entire life, no traction made. And so what we have to do is we have to shift gears and actually go at the systems that allow for these corporations to be the decision makers when it comes to those, right? And that means we have to get at settler colonialism. We have to get at racial capitalism. We have to get at white supremacy. And those systems and those structures that were built upon those three have to be dismantled for us to actually be able to stop the fossil fuel industry, for us to be able to stop extractive industry and those, those industries that will continue to harm Mother Earth. And ultimately, my people, because we are oftentimes the sacrificial lambs when it comes to the, the environmental justice movement. You were at Standing Rock. Tell us about Standing Rock and tell us about where things stand now. Yeah, so I was at Standing Rock. I was, you know, we were some of the first crews to, to hit the ground at Standing Rock. Um, I was there, I think, for four months before I left um, and helped found Red Warrior Camp. And yeah, you know, just really um, believed. I really believed in what we were doing. And um, 
honestly, like I feel like when I talk about Standing Rock, it's really hard because it was a horrible experience for me. Um, I know a lot of people really, you know, they went there and they had like political awakenings and they had spiritual awakenings and they, they were able to live out these like lives that were very beautiful there, right, in camp. It was not that for me. I was on the back end organizing all the logistics um, and that was really hard, you know, and so I think that, yeah, what what I ended up having to actually step away after a while just, just because the, the infighting that was happening was really hard on me and like my family um, and family members that were also there. But what I ended up doing is launching the No Dapple Global Solidarity Campaign. Say that again, please. No Dapple Global Solidarity Campaign. And so what I quickly found out, per usual, is that we are stronger together. We have to work across movements, and we have to make this an international issue that affects all people, not just indigenous people, right? Although we were the ones at that moment being targeted. You know, when we fight, when indigenous peoples fight for clean water and to prevent extractive industry and the fossil fuel industry from destroying Mother Earth, we do that on behalf of all people. That's not just for us, it's for everyone downstream who also needs water to survive. And so my rally cry at Standing Rock was actually like, if you need clean air to breathe, to live, you need clean water to drink, and you need the earth to live on, this is your fight. And that's what we have to continue to hold, right? Um, and so Standing Rock was really that. And in terms of the pipeline, it, it went through, you know, it did, it went through. It was a pretty long drawn out and ugly battle and people from all over the world showed up for this fight, and it was very powerful. Um, I would say it, it was unsuccessful in terms of stopping the pipeline, but it was successful in terms of people had political awakenings. People went there, they were politicized, they were educated, and they were activated. So when they went home after Standing Rock, they organized. And now we see all of these like organizers all over the country, right? that are organizing their communities and fighting those fights, which is so powerful. We did not see that as much, right, before Standing Rock. Um, where it can't stands currently, now they're doing the EIS statement, which was supposed to have been done how long ago. <laughs> so now the EIS statement is going, and so there's open public comment periods that's happening. Actually, so many people had showed up to give comment that they extended the deadline for these open comments, and so that's where, the, that's where it's at right now. Um, in terms of me personally, where things are at, um, I was sued by by them. You know, Dakota Absolute. I was sued by them, um, Energy Transfer Partners, and you know they came at me under the RICO Act, and so they filed you know felony, and then they they put it under the RICO Act. It was dismissed, thank God, and also like because I had amazing representation, um, and then they turned around and filed back in North Dakota court right now, and so I have been in this lawsuit for the last like five, six years. Um, so that's where I stand currently with, with that. You're a veteran. Yes. And uh, is it, uh, you're a member of Veterans Against the War? About uh, face Veterans Against War, yeah. What, uh, um, what a journey. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to go into all the all the uh, uh, the journey up to enlisting, if you don't want, but mm -hmm. you're serving in Kuwait and uh, in, in Iraq, and uh, you find yourself in in uh, solidarity with with uh, uh, Kuwaitis and Iraqis mm -hmm. and others. Yeah. Uh, and and then you you uh, uh, are discharged, and now you belong to this organization that protests uh, the war. Talk to us about that, that journey. Yeah, I mean, I enlisted as I talk about how young people often think we know everything. And so I was young when I enlisted. I thought I knew everything. And I thought that was the route, right, to go. Um, and I ended up in Kuwait, 2009 to 2010. And as you said, like, I really, I realized very quickly that I had more in common uh, with with um, Kuwaitis and they're, they're called third country nationals and so it's, they, they are neither the occupied or the occupying country, they're a third country. Um, and so folks from like Sri Lanka or Pakistan or India would come onto U.S. military installations and work, right? And so I would stop in at, and visit them, you know, and just like, and I also realized like I, I look more like them as well and like related to them. And, and as I got to know these folks, I realized like, wow, these are really like, 
these are my people, right? Like these are who I relate to, and this is I understand their stories more than the people I served with. Um, and so very quickly, you know, the military was not for me. <laughs> and um, yeah, and I actually, you know, was discharged in 2014. Um, but I was actively organizing before I was even discharged and I was engaging in spaces and I, I actually was ashamed for a long time. You know, as I was in movement spaces, I wouldn't tell anyone I was a veteran. I, would, I was just there, right? Until I ended up at a, at a just transition gathering in Black Mesa, Arizona. And, um, you know, one of my mentors, Sharon Lungo, she, I had just met her there and she, you know, noticed me and talked with me and realized that like my military skill sets directly translated to organizing, to activism, and to nonviolent direct action. And she basically told me like, we need to get you into training. Um, you know, and so that started her and I's relationship. You know, we're still close, everything. I still go to her for anything that comes up. Um, I still reach out. And also, you know, had she not seen something in me, I don't, who knows, you know, what path I really would have went down because I was so ashamed of, of those skill sets that I had from the military. And so after that, you know, I committed to really translating my skill sets. And then I ran into About Face and, you know, I started to really push there and I started to work for them. Um, a friend of mine, Brittany DeBarros, um, her and I actually ran, we co-directed the, the Drop the Military Industrial Complex campaign. And so we, you know, we organized and we continue to like try to organize and pull in more anti-war veterans, especially coming off of like Operation Iraqi Freedom and um, yeah, and so I've been organizing there. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm kind of like in between because I've been so busy with like the land back movement on the earth, so I haven't been as active with them. Um, and I stepped away from them for a bit too because it was just like, it's too much <laughs> to hold all of the things. Um, but recently we were just in DC um, in these, our, all of our crew came together and some of them were arrested demanding that Senator Gillibrand actually um, uh, call for a ceasefire, you know, and so rather than call for a ceasefire, she had us arrested. <laughs> and so I was not arrested, but, uh, you know, my friends were arrested um, as veterans in her office and she never called for a ceasefire. Uh, but I think one thing that we realized is that, you know, veterans, especially veterans, anti-war veterans, and folks who have actually seen what war does, we know that war is not the answer. It's yeah. never the solution. It's never going to lead to peace. Yeah. Um, and so that's really kind of the, the rally cry right now, is to really acknowledge that like that is not the answer. It's not the solution. Um, and that really, as veterans, we hold a lot of privilege in this country, right? And we need to leverage that privilege with everything we have um, to continue to call for a ceasefire, continue to end this. I have one more question for you, and this is, it's, an easy, it's a difficult question, uh, but, but it's, it lies at the heart of who you are. Uh, and so, um, let me just, let me get right to it. We're at day 65 of Israel's genocidal assault mm -hmm. uh, on Gaza. I often say, no matter what the media tries to tell us, this isn't a war on Hamas. It's not even a war on Gaza. Mm -hmm. I say it's a war on truth. I say that it's a war on Palestinian culture, history, tradition, Palestinian memory. It's a war on Palestinian people. I say it's a, it's, it's a, a war that's trying to erase the idea of Palestine itself. Mm -hmm. And as an indigenous woman, you get that mm -hmm. because you've lived that in your own history. Mm -hmm. And so talk about the, that juxtaposition and why you understand what, and why you stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people so much during this time from your own personal history as an indigenous woman. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been talking about it the last few days, but really, you know, reflecting back on my own history, I, I sit and I listen, you know, I have Palestinian sisters and like friends who are really close to me, right? Like they're actually some of the closest people to me in the world. Um, and listening to their conversations when they're making decisions and they're, they're talking through all of the different politics and, and the human side of things and the feelings and just all of the things, right? Um, I'm sitting there and I'm just thinking like, wow, this is really probably what my ancestors were talking about before we were forced to sign treaties, 
or before we you know fought back or before we made hard decisions or before we were forcibly removed from a place and decided to come home you know and so I, I was thinking about that of just every story that I've heard so far every atrocity that we've witnessed on social media so far I have a story for my people that's the exact same story um, and so knowing what they're going through and seeing that I reflect back on like what my people went through. We've been in this for 500 years, you know? We know what the result is. We're still fighting, we're still resisting, and also an entire country was built over the top of us. And we are invisibilized on our own land. We don't even exist here. The majority of Americans don't even know that Native Americans, my people, still exist. Let alone know our history let alone know our identities, let alone know what's important to us or that we're trying to reclaim land or all of these things, right? Let alone prioritizing our sovereignty, right? And so for me, it's very important. It's actually like critical that we support Palestinians and that we ensure their liberation and we ensure that every Palestinian refugee and every Palestinian that was displaced be allowed to go home because we know exactly what happens you cease to exist on your own land. And that is what's happening. That's the trajectory. They're trying to erase Palestinians from ever even existing, right? Um, and so we know deeply what happens. We know intimately what happens um, with settler colonial projects like so-called Israel, like the so-called US. Um, and so when you know my Palestinian siblings get to go home and when they're liberated, I am actually that much closer to my own sovereignty because of that. And so it's actually imperative that we support that. Just quickly to close, as an example of what you just said, talk to us about the olive tree and the buffalo. Yeah, so that was, you know, my connection to Palestine wasn't political, you know, and, and it, wasn't, um, it wasn't what we're seeing in the news right now. My connection to Palestine was at Standing Rock. I met Nadia. Actually, not in person. We actually didn't meet in person until like one or two years later. Um, but we, there was a panel, and we were on this panel, um, and they presented about the olive tree and just like the, both like the material support and the material use of the olive tree, right? But they also talked about like the spiritual and cultural significance and the lessons, the the moral lessons that come from the relationship to an olive tree, right? Excuse me, and like thinking of an olive tree as like a sibling. Right, someone that's part of the family. And so it actually, and then to see pictures and to observe um, Israeli settlers burning them down, thousands of year old trees just gone. Um, and it really, it really made me emotional and it reminded me immediately of Buffalo. Um, so when settlers came here to our lands and they expanded westward with the trains, they started to shoot the buffalo across the entire prairie, all of the plains, and, and there was pictures of just like these buffalo skulls, thousands of bus, buffalo skulls just piled on top of each other. The hides weren't used, the meat wasn't used, nothing was used, it was just a waste. And they did that intentionally because they knew that if they cut our life source, right, the, the cultural teachings, the spiritual teachings, the material use of it, right, the practical use of this, that they would disconnect us further from the land. We wouldn't have the ability to do that and it made us dependent on what they offered us. Right? Um, and that was strategic. The same way that burning olive trees is strategic. It's meant to hurt us, right? It's meant to like deepen that wound. Um, and so whenever I heard that story, it was really emotional. And, and right then and there, I knew like this was my fight. And, and I will carry this fight as my own fight. And I, I do to this day. Crystal Tubles, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it.